Good morning again, church family. It is good to be in God's house with God's people as we gather around God's word. Now, I want I wonder just out of curiosity, how many of you, when you picked up a bulletin and were looking at it before service started, noticed something missing on an inside page? Jim did. Some people did. Yeah, the study guide page isn't there, and there is a reason for that, and I will share that with you, the reason for the study guide page being gone. As I anticipated this morning's sermon, for several weeks, I have struggled with what message to bring. And I had helpful suggestions from a number of people. Several said to me, just talk about your 22 years at Menden. And I said, I'm not writing my eulogy. <laughs> now, that's, somebody else can write that. And it really was a struggle. I kept looking for a scripture that might speak to me and through the Spirit help me know what to talk about or do. And then this past Wednesday, because as Wednesday came to a close, I still didn't know what I was going to do this morning. And I hadn't felt that God had given me any direction on it. And it was very disturbing. It was a, a difficult place to be. I thought, well, we could get up here and have a 25-minute hymn sing. But, and then a very wise elder of this church, Brother Schutz is blushing, I, if you didn't see it. I told him about my quandary, and he said, preach the first last. I looked at him, I thought he was speaking a foreign tongue. No, <laughs> Preach the first last. And so when I asked him, what he, and he said, preach the first sermon you preach to Menden as your last. And he said, that's sort of bookending. And I said, well, you know, for those of us who are obsessive compulsive and have to have everything neatly done, this works for me. And then within two hours, another person from the church who hadn't spoken with Jim said exactly the same thing. And I said... Maybe God is giving some confirmation in this. And so after a little bit of prayer Wednesday night and saying, yeah, I think this is what God wants me to do. Then I got to say, and I knew what my first sermon was I ever preached at Menden. I knew the title of it. I remembered that this is funny. After 32 years of how many hundred sermons, I remembered the title of it. And I thought, the manuscript is in one of the 20 boxes of sermons in the basement. <laughs> so Jim set me on an interesting journey of hours digging through my basement looking for, for that message. And I found it. Preached January 12th, 1992, and it said Menden. So I'm giving you a disclaimer right now. I'd like to think 22 years of doing this, you would improve over time, okay? I read this sermon. I said, I really didn't preach this to a bunch of people, did I? You've got to be kidding me. I actually trotted this thing out. And, and I actually tried to back out of it the structure so I could give you a study guide page, because there was no study guide page 22 years ago. And reading it, I couldn't find the structure for it to make the study guide. I said, this is really promising. <laughs> and then I had some peace about it. I thought, this is, it's the first sermon I preached. I came here at the old church, and I just came to fill in the pulpit one Sunday morning because the pastor had retired and was not looking for a call. I was chaplain at Kirkhaven. This sermon, and when you hear it, you'll wonder how in the world these people, 22 years ago, after hearing this sermon, decided I needed to come here as pastor. Because looking at this sermon, I don't think I should have gone anywhere as pastor. But, friend, it, it, you're going to have your moment. And so... I am going to share with you the first as the last. And I've gone over it. I have done very little, because somebody said, oh, well, you'll just take and rewrite it, right? And I said, well, that's not much making it the first as the last then. 
and there were a few places I had to take and do something to, to resuscitate it. And <laughs> so, so I am going to share with you what Menden Church heard 22 years ago this last month. And, um, and since I do believe that, well, God will lead you into what to, to bring, ultimately the result of it is in God's hand and in his spirit. And I got to thinking, too, yesterday, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you heard this sermon January 12th, 1992? One, two, three, four, five, five people in this room. That's what struck me was that this sermon will be brand new to virtually every one of you. And so God can use it. God can use it. The five who raised your hands, you're excused from class. <laughs> so we are going to look at some scripture. We'll take a walk in the word as we do every Lord's Day. Let's take the, the book. And I'm going to start in Ecclesiastes. Does this have anything to do with the sermon? No. Does it have something to do with how I'm seeing this time in my life in ministry? Yes. And so I'm inviting you to look at Ecclesiastes Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11a. And I'm going to invite you to share this with me as a, uni uh, a, a responsive reading. I'll read the odd verses if you would respond with the even. And so I'll give everybody a chance to find Ecclesiastes 3. And, you know, depending on what your generation is, you may well remember this being put to music as a pop song. Friends... There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. What does the worker gain from his toil? He has made everything beautiful in its time. And I'm going to invite you to turn to the gospel according to Luke. And not, it's not in the bulletin. It is on the slide. We're going to start with Luke 14, verses 15 through 23. Actually, 16 through 24. So much for my bifocals. Okay. 14, chapter 15, beginning with verse excuse me, 14, beginning with verse 16. Hear now the word of God from the gospel writer Luke. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything's now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Of course, I want to say to him, you bought a field without seeing it? You know, come on. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I need, I'm on my way to go try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I've just got married, so I can't come. Well, bring your bride. No. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants. Now listen, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring in who? The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you'd ordered has been done, but there still is room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes. Make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Those who were invited who didn't come, and the blind, the halt, the lame, the weak, the poor, come to the banquet. Let's turn to Luke 19, 1 through 10. 
because we're going to talk a little bit about this fellow today. Luke 19, 1 through 10. Please join me. Let's share these verses together as a unison reading. We'll read this together. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today's salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. I always invite you to keep your thumb in that scripture that we're working with, and you certainly can do that today. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we have just shared reading your word. Now, Lord, we're going to reflect upon your word and how we long for your spirit to guide our reflection, guide our thoughts. Heavenly Father, be powerfully present with your people this day and speak to us through this message, Lord, because no matter how humble the offering we may make, you bless it and sanctify it, and you make it yours to do with as you would choose. So, Lord, may the meditations of our hearts, the words that I speak, be found acceptable to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Everybody knows Zacchaeus? Everybody knows the little children's song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. How many grew up singing that in Sunday school? Every, virtually no one knows it. Oh. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but Zacchaeus was also something else. He was a misfit. He didn't belong. There's very little normal about him. Not his occupation, not his habits, not his income. He was a Jew. He was appointed by the Romans. So Zacchaeus was a collaborator with the hated occupying army of his country. So he's not well regarded by fellow Jews. His work was unpopular. He was a tax collector. Not only was he a tax collector, scripture says he was a chief tax collector. So he worked for the Roman IRS. And we all know how much we like them. So Folks in his community, neighbors, wouldn't ask him out to dinner, wouldn't invite him to their home. You know, he wouldn't feel welcome at his synagogue. We're told in income, he's above average. In stature, he's below average. And this is the one story that survives about this man in the scriptures. What we find out is this. He's the odd man out in Jericho. He is the odd man out. Jesus is coming to town. Jesus is passing through Jericho. And people are turning out. This is his last journey to Jerusalem. They didn't know that. Jesus did. And a mob surges to catch a glimpse of this young prophet from Nazareth. You know, they've heard stories about him. And so they want to see him for themselves. And Zacchaeus, being the wee little man, is in a crowd. And he does what children throughout history have had to do to be able to look over the bodies and the heads of adults in front of them. What does he do? He climbs a tree. He climbs a tree. And, you know, he, he gets up into the tree, and he gets out on a limb. And right now I'm going to do something nasty to him. I'm leaving him up a tree and out on a limb. Feel familiar to some of you? Yeah. Some of us have been spent our limb sitting time. Yeah. But I think that there's another image I want to share with you this morning besides this guy up a tree and out on a limb that you might respond to, identify with, even more powerfully. Now let me share it with you. This picture in your minds, if you will, whether it's a church like ours with chairs or it's a church with pews 
I want you to picture in your minds the front pew of a lovely church. And there in that front pew stands a very lovely family. Standing there in church. Now I notice, well we could have the three of you standing. No, okay. But ever notice how the front pews are always empty or the front seats? Yeah. I mean if you sit in the front one, that's the anxious bench. That means you need to get as close as you can to God's word. Okay. Got that, Terry? Okay. And so I want you to picture a family sitting here, even though they aren't sitting here. You can picture them, and they are just this nice-looking family in the front pew, and I'm going to name them. They are Mr. and Mrs. Normal, and they're three normal children, okay? And there they are, nicely dressed, but not too expensively, right? And they look devout, but not too devout. And they're, you know, they're singing a hymn, but not too enthusiastically, after all, they are Presbyterian. And so we are not going to be enthusiastic. Yeah. And just by looking at Mr. and Mrs. Normal, a lot of things we can tell. They fell in love at just the right time, and their relationship is absolutely wonderful. No problems in their relationship. Their children came at just the right intervals. No surprises or problems. They would be acceptable guests in any normal home. They would be welcome members in any normal club, like the Menden Country Club. Their opinions on current affairs would be considered correct for normal thinking men and women. They can eat without gaining weight, and I hate them for it. <laughs> you know, they're always thin, the normal people. It's the abnormal who aren't, you know. Their children are going to grow up, they'll pass every exam at the right time, and they'll make the right kind of friends, never a worry for the parents, and they're perfectly adjusted to a society of normal people. There they are. Oh, you can go back one row, and there's the Alcorns. <laughs> so there they are at worship without a worry in the world, the normal family. Now, let me tell you something if you don't realize it that the people outside of the church believe the normal family is the stuff of which the church of Jesus Christ is made. People who aren't believers, people who don't know the Lord, people who would never set foot through the door here think the normal family is what this church is made of. And they look at themselves and say, I sure don't measure up. I wouldn't belong. You know? This is part of a mythology. Mythology, first, that there exists such a completely normal family, and secondly, and this worries me much more, that Christians are thought to be around just to bless this normalcy, that we, we're to inspire everyone to reach that goal of being the normal family. And this myth is responsible for a lot of unhappiness. Friends, as real flesh and blood human beings try in vain to become or measure up to the normal family and what happens to them. They fail, they feel the misfit, they don't belong. Many will live a sham trying to put up a pretense of normalcy. And we're haunted by the pretty pictures of the normal family. Images we see, magazines, television. And we feel guilty if our lives don't quite fit the normal pattern. And if we brew long enough on our failure to measure up, on our differences, we could be driven to despair. People cope through addictions, feeling that they don't belong, that they aren't, you know, this model that everyone thinks you ought to be, and they feel they're the odd ones out in a world of well-adjusted, normal people. Hmm. I think how much healthier it would be for all of us if we just kicked Mr. and Mrs. Normal and their three normal brats back to Never Never Land where they came from because they don't exist. They don't exist. And we have to frankly face the fact that you and I are just sinful, struggling, hopeful, half-filled, half-frustrated people, you know, with each with our own quirks, our own oddities, our own unique experience of the rough and tumble of human life. The normal family. It bothers me that this myth hangs around the church 
and in sermons and in prayers and in hymns, the impressions given that the church is here to bless them and that the pews are peopled by normal families whose smooth passage through life just needs a periodic boost from the church. Yeah. We give the impression that the vast majority of church members fit into this conventional pattern. That's what the church projects to the world. That's what we say to the world. And the world says, I don't belong there. You know, and, and we're told we need to pray for those few unfortunate misfits outside our doors. You know, the unhappy, the deprived, the bereaved, the hurting. Well, it's time we got honest and we woke up to who we really are in the Church of Jesus Christ. First place, the truth is, is that a large proportion of an average congregation is unmarried, widowed, divorced, childless, and at any moment that cannot conform to the pattern of the normals. And more importantly, there's not one of us who hasn't got a frustration. There's not one in this room who doesn't have a private worry or a secret battle or a twist of character or an agonizing experience that if it was known would shut us out of this happy picture of the normal family. See, if I was with my church in North Carolina, I'd have some amens to that. <laughs> so let's face it, if there's such a thing as normalcy, everyone in this room is a misfit. Every one of us. Let's own it. You know? The damage that's done if we insist on this myth is terrible. It's terrible, friends. It leaves so many feeling that they're just not the right type of person. They're left with the impression they don't belong in the society of healthy, normal Christians. You know, so if you take nothing else with you this morning from this 22-year-old message, please take this. I want you to have the wonderful sense of relief in knowing that the person sitting beside you, behind you, in front of you is just as abnormal as you are, okay? So you take a look at them. Look at them. They are just as abnormal as you are. So friends, the secret's out. The secret is out. You know, so we don't have to work so hard to keep the secret in. We don't have to live under the strain of thinking we're the odd ones out and everyone else is normal. Thank you. <laughs> friends, the church has succeeded in projecting an image of Christians that has far more in common with a normal family than with Zacchaeus up a tree and out on a limb. And that is a crime. Why are there so many people within a short radius of any Christian church, including this one, who would never dream of coming through the doors of a church? This church, any church. I'm thinking of the thousands who have exactly the same concerns and the same needs, the same hopes and the same anxieties and the same fears and the same joys that every one of us has. How is it that they instinctively feel this isn't their place and they don't belong here? We've sold them a bill of goods. We have sold them a falsehood about who's sitting in this room. And they feel they don't belong. It isn't their kind of place. They've accepted the myth of the normal Christian or normal family and that's what Christians are. And they know they don't measure up, they don't qualify, they don't belong. What's tragic is, is that so many of us are playing at being the normal family rather than being a fellowship of misfits. A fellowship of misfits who one day at a time are graciously shaped and loved by our Lord, living it one day at a time. You know, and I think it's interesting that Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous but the sinners. We can almost see quotation marks around the word righteous when he says it. I didn't call, come to call the righteous. You know, why? He knew that the righteous are like the normal family. Because they build themselves that way. That's what Pharisees did. They were righteous and they were normal. Romans 3.10, what did Paul say about the righteous? There is no one righteous, what? No, not one. 
Not one of us is righteous. Now, Jesus said that it's those who know they're sick that go to the doctor. Well, friends, this is the doctor's house. And if you've come here, you're acknowledging your need for healing. You've come to the doctor's house. Now, and I believe this, that the only ones who are excluded from the kingdom of God are those who believe they're too normal to need the healing of God in their life. That they, they believe that they are so self-secure, so self-sufficient. They don't acknowledge their brokenness, and they don't come. Luke 14, Jesus tells a parable about the man and his party, right? We just read it. And, you know, he invites all these guests, and all these guests are too busy to come. They're too busy to come. They're absorbed in their normal activities of daily life, you know, their busyness of life. I've just bought a piece of land. I need to go out and see it. Well, you should have looked at it before you bought it. Okay, fine. But excuse me, I bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to go out and put them to the test. I've got to prove them. Excuse me. I've just gotten married. That's an interesting reason not to come to a party. You know, I can't possibly come to your party. So what happened? The host of the banquet, the host of the banquet says to his servants, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And friends, if you want to have a picture, an illustration, a Kodak moment of what the kingdom of God looks like, you just got it read to you. That's the kingdom of God. The poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. That is the kingdom of God. For they are the ones who respond to the invitation. They are the ones who come. You know, and those who feel no need for God's grace and healing aren't at his table. So God sends you know, his son to a society of misfits. Misfits. To so those rejected, those who are despised by the normal society. But of such is the kingdom of heaven. Such is the kingdom provided for Zacchaeus. He's still sitting up a tree. And a crowd is surging beneath him. And they're struggling and they're pushing to get a glimpse of Jesus as he passes through. And we might expect at this moment Jesus to seize the opportunity to preach an impromptu sermon, right? I mean, come on. Any preacher who gets a crowd of people in front of him, you know, you'd think Jesus is just going to set right off into a sermon. He doesn't. He doesn't. His eyes pass over the crowd. And then his eyes go up to a branch in a tree. And Zacchaeus finds himself held in the steady, penetrating gaze of the Son of God. He wasn't banking on that that day. That's not what he was doing up a tree, to be held in the gaze of Christ. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down today. I must stay at your house. And I believe this, friends, we never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ until we realize that this is how Jesus meets us all. You know, some think the gospel is some generic message of goodwill to the world that's just wafted over a crowd like incense. That's not the gospel. Or that it's only understood by religious people. That's not the gospel. The gospel comes to each of us at the very point of our greatest need, at that point where, where we have our greatest pain, where we're the most aware of our alienation from others and from our God. In a true service of worship, the gospel is not wafted over the crowd. In a true service of worship, the gospel of Jesus Christ comes like an arrow to the heart of every one. An arrow of love, of mercy, of healing, of forgiveness, piercing the place of our pain. When we come into the presence of the living God, he speaks to each one of us, calls each one of us. He knows all there is to know about us. He knows the very thing that makes you feel the misfit. He knows the very thing that hurts your life. And he calls you. He knows what makes you feel self-conscious or ashamed. And he calls you. He says, today I must stay at your house. So the gospel is most powerfully for us when we we feel the misfit. So what happens? Here's the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus calls him out of his tree, off of his limb, says, I've got to go stay at your house today. What happens? Everything then go all right? I mean, it's reading the scripture. Yeah. 
Zacchaeus is down out of the tree, that means everything's going to be hunky-dory, right? Everyone's going to love him. Everyone's going to celebrate. They're going to have a dance and a party because Jesus is called Zacchaeus, right? Well, there's nothing to suggest Zacchaeus suddenly became one of the good old boys of Jericho. Nothing there. He's not, we don't have any idea he's welcomed by his neighbors, respected in the community. But Jesus didn't call Zacchaeus to be popular with the people. Christians, will you hear that? You're not called to be popular with the people. You're called to be faithful to God. That's why you're called. You know, and how did the crowd respond when Jesus said salvation has come to Zacchaeus? You got to be kidding. Him? This Jesus is no prophet. He doesn't know anything. They were bitterly angry at, at Jesus. They, they reviled Jesus. They challenged him. He's going to be the guest of a sinner. How scandalous. How outrageous. Well, guess what? They'd say the same thing if Jesus came to be a guest at your house today or mine. He's coming to be the guest of a sinner. Anyone doesn't believe that? Aren't you glad he comes to be the guest of the sinner? I mean, that's, yeah. There's no standardized model Christian disciple. We're not cookie cutter Christians. We're not stamped from one mold. You know, and there's no reason to believe that the burdens we have to bear are instantly removed by faith in Christ. Jesus says, I'll give you the strength to bear them. I'll give you the strength to bear them. You know, there's a lot of things that Zacchaeus is always going to be left out. He's always going to be the, the misfit in many ways. But I thought about it. Think of the great saints through the history of the Christian church. How many of the great saints in the Christian history would have been called normal by the standard of their society? So why should we think we should be called normal by the standard of society if we've come to Christ? If anything, you are now an odd one out in the culture and in the community. You know, Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and says, I want you just as you are. Friends, here's the good news of the gospel. I'm not okay. You're not okay. But with God, that's okay. You know, that's the important thing for us to hear. You know, I don't have to become okay before God will love me and call me. It's all right. And so... It's a word of acceptance. That, you know, this is, uh, Jesus took him as he was, loved him as he was, gave him salvation because he responded to Christ. And that's the word of acceptance we as Christians need to bring to the world every day, 365 days a year, friends. That's what we need to do. You know, to a hurting world, a lost world, a world full of broken people. That's what we need to bring. And from the moment Zacchaeus encountered Jesus, we see he began to be healed in his attitudes and his actions. I'll return what I've stolen. I'll compensate those I've hurt. So the Spirit of God is already at work in this man's heart. This healing wasn't to make him Mr. Popularity. This healing was to bring him to maturity in Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. We just read a wonderful story of a misfit, despised and rejected, a misfit who is now a citizen in the kingdom of God. What a joy. What a celebration. You know, it's just how wonderful that is. And to the, you know, yes, the key is going to be a misfit, but because he welcomed Christ into his home and into his heart, that this misfit now fits the kingdom just right. This is the gospel we have to share, not with a crowd, not with anonymous masses. This is the gospel we must share with every unique, every individual, every fundamentally non-normal man, woman, and child we encounter. So I want to ask this question. Who are we that we would help the misfits in the community? Who are we to help the misfits? What's that? Yeah. Who better to help the misfits than those of us who are misfits? And we know we're misfits. 
and we aren't ashamed or afraid to say we're misfits. And we know what it is to be up a tree and out on a limb and to have Jesus call us out of that place and say, I'm coming to be with you. Yeah, who better than we? So friends, I want to challenge you this morning. Come down off of your limb and out of the tree because Jesus wants to stay at your home today. Are you ready to make him welcome? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is a word of comfort and reassurance. It's a word of challenge and opportunity. Your word. Lord, we thank you for loving Zacchaeus and leaving us this remarkable record that we might see ourselves reflected in a story. For we surely know what it is to be up a tree and out on a limb and wonder how we're coming down. But when you call us, we are safely brought home. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this remarkable, remarkable witness. And may each of us in this room embrace who we are, flawed, fractured, broken human beings, but made whole in Jesus Christ. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Who? Jim. Thank you, Jim. And thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, after I found that in the right box and read it over, I thought, how in the world could anyone respond to that? And, well, <laughs> it took you 22 years to get me to be able to take and put together and preach a, a good one. So that's... But... Thank, God bless you. Thank you all so much. And, um, you know, I hope that uh, that, that sermon uh, did speak to some people. I hope the Spirit can use it again after 22 years. Because that's what God does. Um, he'll take and use what we may think is not worth his effort. Um, anyway, so you're going to force me to get this out. No, it's not. So, and I thank you all for being here. Um, we need to sing, don't we? And we need to do something for me. You say it to me. May you have it. <laughs> so we're going to go out with a song in our hearts as we continue to put to music God's word and learn it commit it to our hearts this way. So let's sing God's